Hey there guys, Spexy here once again bringing you another piping hot slice of gaming history. This is going to be an ultimate video. No, quite literally this video is all about a little software house that embarks on a bloody big adventure resulting in video game stardom. I am of course referring to Ultimate Play the Game. But before I start, I'd like to say that this will not likely be the first Ultimate History video that you'll find on YouTube. There have been many others that have told this tale, in their own way of course. Most notably for me, the amazing Kim Justice in 2016, and if you haven't checked out her channel, then I very much urge that you do so. However, as I grew up with the ZX Spectrum as my first real home computer, it is very much part of the roots of my entire gaming life. And well, the Spectrum just wouldn't have been the Spectrum without Ultimate. And for me, that's the very reason that I'm making this video. So sit tight as we go back to 1982, to the quaint little English town of Aspi de Lazoch, where two brothers are about to embark on an epic quest that they probably could never have imagined would turn out the way it did. Chris and Tim Stamper, former arcade developers who had worked with many games companies on numerous titles, including reportedly Konami on their smash hit arcade game Gyrus, had grown tired of working for others and dreamt of breaking out on their own. Along with a former college friend, John Lathbury, and Tim's then girlfriend and future wife, Carol Ward, the two founded the company ACG, or Ashby Computer and Graphics Limited. Initially concentrating on providing arcade conversion kits to the industry, they also decided to branch out into games development once again for the home computer market, and this time making games that they wanted to make. And it wasn't long before they were showing the world what they were capable of. Working from a humble four-bedroom mid-terrace house next door to the family-run corner shop, this was a very small yet efficient team. Chris and John worked primarily on the coding side of things, while Carol and Tim concentrated on the presentation and the graphics, with Carol also acting like a secretary to the business. The whole outfit was run on a shoestring budget, with little enough money to barely pay off the bills for the initial six months of the business. Things were tight, but that was all about to change. With the release of Jetpack in May 1983 for the then most popular home computer on the UK market, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. This game was a phenomenal overnight success for the team, whose hard work and effort had definitely paid off by delivering the public a true 100% original arcade hit for the home computer market. This game was fast, slick, good looking, and most of all, downright addictive. Don't be fooled by its colourful cute graphics or its quirky blips and farty noises. This game was hard and continued to get increasingly harder at an alarming rate, if you could manage to stay alive long enough to witness it. What they had managed to pull off here on a home computer was absolutely groundbreaking, though it may not seem so now, but at the time, the fact that they got the specy to deliver this level of arcade quality gameplay was astounding, particularly considering it was all done in only 16K of RAM. The sales figures were no less impressive, with Jetpack selling over a staggering 300,000 copies to around a million Spectrum owners at that time. That means that nearly one third of all Spectrum users owned a copy of this game. Now it's not entirely surprising if you consider the Spectrum game library on offer at that time, as this game was something that had simply not been seen on a home computer before. And if you had, or even if you did play this game, then you'll understand exactly what I mean. I was one of those 300,000, and I remember quite vividly being completely blown away with this game, and spending way too many hours playing it, if that's possible. The turnover for this game was also pretty incredible, banking the team over one million pound. Not too shabby for your first game, right? But they weren't even started yet. Although Jetpack may arguably be one of the most successful games the team would ever create, they followed it up just one month later in June 83 with yet another Spectrum release. This time it was Psst, a rather cutesy arcade romp seeing you as Robbie, an eco-friendly robot gardener desperately trying to fend off hordes of creepy crawlies, all eager to destroy his horticultural dreams by eating his flowers. And while this game may not be nearly as fun as Jetpack in terms of gameplay, it certainly has oodles of charm that carry it off. I simply love the look of this game. Those cleanly drawn cute characters with sweet googly eyes became somewhat of a trademark style for Ultimate, as you'll see a little later on. So moving on, just one month again, damn these guys were busy, and we come to the team's third release, Trans Am. And although I'm not a huge fan of this game, I do see the quality and level of detail in it that had become expected of them and that so many other software houses just couldn't compete with at the time. It just wasn't my bag. But something was about to come. This was a very crucial time in gaming history for me. My favourite early Ultimate game was just appearing on the horizon. The game in question? Cookie. 
and I was going to eat it all up, every sodden last crumb of it. Um, nom, 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 oh, nom, 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 nom. Ah, what a game. And look, those googly eyes are back. This time they even adorn oddly named inanimate objects. I wonder if that'll catch on. Uh -huh. This game wasn't easy, but then who wants easy? It did, however, deliver heart-racing, fast-paced action as Chef Charlie tries in desperation to create his gastronomical masterpieces by shooting only the needed ingredients into his giant mixing bowl, like the custard and the sugar and all the nice things, and keeping the bolts and the washers and the fish bones the hell out of there. This game was amazing, although it may not look it by today's standards. However, I would highly recommend that anyone wanting to try out the Spectrum itself, or maybe even some emulation, definitely gives this one a look. So, 1983, a big year for Ultimate, making their first four games in just a few months. All of them undeniable success stories, and all of them playable with only 16k of RAM. It still amazes me that they were able to create these awesome games with such a limitation binding them. Just imagine what they'd be capable of with twice that amount of memory. Well, you wouldn't have to wait long, because the last quarter of the very same year, Ultimate released two more games, this time in glorious 48k, Lunar Jetman and... Attic Attack. Lunar Jetman is the not very long awaited sequel to their big blockbuster hit Jetpack, but this time seeing a whole different style of gameplay, with Jetman trying to destroy the numerous alien bases by means of taking his vehicle across the lunar surface, laying girders to fill in holes along the way in an attempt to deliver a bomb to the enemy by dropping it on their missile bases. Sounds easy, it really isn't, but in any case it was a lot of fun. Haha, <laughs> get wrecked. Oh right, it's like that is it? Attic Attack has got to be an all time classic for many reasons. Firstly in terms of exploration with a huge manor house to explore, the choice of selectable characters, the wizard, the surf and the knight, the quirky use of the chicken carcass as a health meter and the puzzle elements requiring you to obtain certain items and keys in order to pass certain monsters or doors. It's an epic quest exploring the house in an attempt to locate and collect all three parts of the golden ACG key. See what they did there? which can be found scattered throughout the many rooms and dungeons, and which is required in full to open the front door and escape your impending doom. And so, a tick attack became yet another classic to add to the company's ever-growing successful games portfolio. So, 1983 is over. What will 1984 bring for the Ultimate team? Well, to start with, arguably the biggest game ever under the Ultimate Play the Game brand, Saberwolf. And it was another huge success, seeing them selling over 300,000 copies. And this time at a higher price bracket than their previous titles, coming in at a whopping £9.95 instead of the usual £5.50 for their other specy titles. Now, Ultimate obviously considered this to be a premium game, and with the recent success of their other games, had chosen to raise the price not only to reflect this, but also to discourage piracy, feeling that it would be less likely to be shared if it was something you'd paid more money for. I'm not quite sure I'd get that logic. In my mind, if something is more unattainable for customers' pockets, then I'd say it's more likely that you would find people copying it, like one of your friends buys one game, another buys the next, and so on, sharing the cost between you all, but also sharing copies of the game with each other. But hey, I might be wrong. I didn't have any friends. What do I know? However, even on the shelf, it was quite clear that this game was aimed at being something rather special, a cut above the rest. Firstly, it came in an anonymous monolithic-like black box, something that would become standard for future Ultimate releases, and this only added an air of intrigue to it before you'd even place the damn cassette into the tape player. On first impression, this technical of jungle romp looks amazing, but it is set in a maze, so yeah. And not unlike a tick attack in its control and premise, negotiating a map of numerous screens collecting four parts of the Saberwolf amulet in order to pass the Saberwolf itself to secure a safe exit from the jungle. It had enemies in abundance, some would argue an unfair amount considering the little you can do to defend yourself, but this game was never supposed to be easy. It did however offer up some power ups and in some cases power downs from consuming the different coloured flowers that can be found on the jungle floor. Some would make you go faster, others invulnerable, whilst another might make your controls turn backwards, but if used correctly these definitely do come in handy. The game had no tutorial or any kind of guide, instead it was down to the player themselves to find out how to play, including, if you were savvy enough, realising that the natives turn yellow when they're in line with a part of the amulet on the map. All in all, a great game and the birth of Saberman, who was to become Ultimate's main character franchise. 
His next two adventures came in the form of Underworld and Night Law, released simultaneously in late 1984. Underworld carried on exactly where Saberwolf left off. Saberman has entered a cave within the jungle and has to try to escape the vast and perilous yet surprisingly lavishly furnished subterranean environment, which I always found to be a bloody tricky affair, not least due to the poor control method and the pixel perfect jumps required to leap and often bounce like a complete idiot around the map, often to your doom. Admittedly this game was big, but don't worry about that, you won't be exploring much of it. You'll spend most of your time being nudged to your death off of numerous ledges by the bloody birds or other annoying enemies over and over and over again. Ah. The game is unforgiving to say the least. It's harsh to the extreme. As such, I never completed this title, but I did try far too many times and perhaps I should admit to, with absolutely no improvement whatsoever. The next game, Night Law, was a totally different kettle of fish. This was something cutting edge, something unique, utilizing an isometric gaming engine that Ultimate liked to call Filmation. Now, this wasn't the first time that we'd seen isometric 3D done on a Spectrum. We'd had Quicksilver's Ant Attack using the solid soft 3D engine, soon to be followed up as well with Zombie Zombie, and while both of these games were pretty good, they were rather basic. Night Law offered much more to the mix, and it did it pretty bloody well. You controlled Saberman, yet again, and maybe quite fittingly after escaping the Saberwolf and the Underworld, you were now cursed to become a wolf yourself. A werewolf, that is. With each rotation of the day-night cycle shown at the bottom right-hand side of the screen, you would transform with a rather awkward and painful looking animation from man to lycanthropic beast and back again. The aim? Quite a simple one. Find a way to dispel the curse and become human once more. The game, however, was not so simple, but it was amazing to play. Traversing platforms, avoiding enemies and spikes, it was the nearest thing we'd ever got to a full 3D environment. Albeit only isometric, this was incredible and everyone seemed to want to be in on the act, with many of the software houses releasing their own isometric games with varying degrees of success. There was Suivo's World, Ocean's Movie and Batman and Where Time Stood Still and The Greatest escape to name but a few. I think it would be fair to say that the best 3D isometric platform game of all time, in my opinion, Head Over Heels, owes it all to Night Law. And of that, there is absolutely no doubt. Ultimate knew that this was cutting edge stuff. They knew that they were way ahead of the competition and unbelievably they'd been waiting almost an entire year before the release of Night Law. It had been ready to go before the initial release of Saberwolf. However, Ultimate knew that releasing it first would not have been a smart move and may actually have spelt doom for the obviously inferior looking title. So instead they held off until after the initial release of Saberwolf had been and gone. At this time Ultimate moved into a new market, the Commodore 64. This was uncharted territories for the team and aside from assigning Firebird to make ports of their earlier specy games for the system, in my opinion it was a journey that perhaps they should not have embarked on. Although they had no part in creating the numerous C64 titles that followed, including the Pendragon series, they did act as a publisher for them. However, in my opinion there is not one of them that stands out as worthy to adorn the Ultimate Play the Game brand name. It's unfortunate but sadly, it's true. Meanwhile, back in Speckyland, Filmation was still going strong, with a further three titles released in 1985, Alien 8, Nightshade and Gunfright, the latter two adopting a new Filmation 2 engine to allow scrolling 3D play areas rather than static screen maps. My personal preference is still the original Filmation engine though. For me, what Filmation 2 gained in its more open world approach, it lacks on in terms of style and gameplay. So as you can see, although Ultimate Play the Game get a ton of praise and recognition from both inside and outside the industry, and deservedly so, they're not without fault. I remember loving Ultimate as a kid, and I still do, but even I must admit that not everything they touched turned to gold. But gold was definitely on the cards for them. US Gold to be more precise, who in 1985 were announced to be taking over the Ultimate brand and releasing games under its name. What followed was a mixed bag. On one hand you had Cyber Run and Pentagram, both Ultimate feeling games, but no one actually knows whether Tim or Chris were actually involved in making them at all, and in any case neither of them have anything new to offer in terms of gameplay, and everything else, well, to be honest, was a total bag of shit. 
With Chris and Tim no longer on board, US Gold simply could not meet the standards or expectations that the press and public demanded, seeing games like Martianoids and Bubbler becoming complete flops, and rightly so, as they were pretty damn terrible, honestly, and did nothing but further tarnish the Ultimate brand. Only one game may have saved them at this point, a game that was in development during this same period and had been mentioned in interviews with US Gold at the time. The game in question was Myomare, though little is known about this game other than it was possibly to be the last in the Saberman series, but with US Gold's Ultimate games already falling fast out of favour with the buy-in public, Myomare was never finished and instead faded into a distant memory, becoming a video game enigma, the ultimate game that never was. So I guess we'll never really know. I do, however, have a demo game made much later in 2014 by a group of European programmers using only the information available to them to create their interpretation of what might have been. And here it is. Oh, sorry, wrong clip. There we go, that's better. Now, I think they actually did a pretty good job here of making an ultimate styled game in terms of graphics and gameplay. And who knows, they might not be a million miles off the original concept. In any case, it's a bloody good attempt, and as such, has fooled some people into believing it's an actual early unfinished version of the game. So, with Chris and Tim now out on their own once more, they turned their attention to a second company that they had set up. Rare, Designs of the Future. Or as you may better know it... Well... Rare. They'd been working on expanding the company from the days before the US gold deal was even on the table, considering the home computer market as a dead-end pursuit, as the popularity outside of Europe was very limited indeed. However, a certain console from Japan had caught their eye. Family computer の楽しいカセット情報シングルスダブルスの本格的なコンピュータ Soon to be known to the rest of the world as the NES, they believed that if they could reverse engineer this system, learn it from the inside out and develop games for it, then this was the future of their business, and thus Rare was formed for exactly that purpose. As such, it was a second company that flew under the radar and was not subject to any takeover deal struck with US Gold. Now, Nintendo had been rather bold in proclaiming that the Famicom could not be decoded. However, back in Blighty, on an imported unit, the Rare team had managed to do just that. And through an arranged meeting with Nintendo, they were able to showcase several tech demos that they'd managed to successfully code for this apparently unhackable system. This impressed Nintendo executive Minoru Arakawa so much that a deal was struck between the two companies, allowing Rare the unlimited budget to make games exclusively for Nintendo. Wow! Unbelievable! Rare would eventually go on to buy back the rights for the Ultimate brand from US Gold to prevent any further damage, and the rest, as they say, is history, and most likely another episode. So there you have it. The history of arguably the most influential software house ever to come out of the UK and its transformation into arguably one of the most influential software houses ever worldwide. I hope that you've enjoyed today's video and if you did then why not spank the hell out of that thumbs up button and don't forget to subscribe for more retro goodness. I've been Spexy, you've been incredibly patient if you've got this far and I look forward to looking backwards with you again in the next episode. See you soon. Bye for now.